The Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 is here, and we not only know the full specs, but the full performance in the first phone that is coming in. And let me tell you guys, Apple should be worried. In this video, I'll give you guys the full breakdown and how it stacks up to the A17 Pro in the iPhone 15 Pro phones, which were just released about a month ago. And man, is this new chip impressive. It has been less than a year and Qualcomm has one upped the 8 Gen 2 in phones like the S23 Ultra. And this phone has already beat out the iPhone 15 Pro's A17 Pro in 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme, getting an average of 21 FPS compared to 20.8 FPS using the unlimited mode. As far as graphics, Qualcomm said that the 8 Gen 3 is 25% faster than the Gen 2, which would mean that it would get roughly 26.25 frames per second, which is very impressive in this difficult 4K test. Apple advertised a 20% jump in graphics from the A6 16, and they did achieve exactly that in shorter tests, but in our 20 minute stress test, we only saw a 14% difference since the titanium iPhone 15 Pros retain heat more so than the stainless steel phones. Now, even more impressive, the HN3 not only gets a larger graphics performance increase, but it is also 25% more efficient, where the A17 Pro is more power hungry than before. But the A17 Pro is three nanometers, so how is this possible when the 8 Gen 3 is a four nanometer design? Well, we made a whole video on this, but to simplify, TSMC's three nanometer yields were so low that they likely had to increase power to get consistent stability on the lower silicon lottery chips because even Apple's four nanometer A16 was more efficient than the three nanometer. With that, Qualcomm has stuck to four nanometers, but they have refined their design even more, getting better performance, lower heat, and saving battery. So it's a win-win staying with four nanometer this year. Now, as far as the main CPU, they also got a 20% efficiency boost, while Apple, for the first time in many years, has kept the battery life ratings the same, although we did see better real-world battery life. For performance, though, Qualcomm stated a 30% performance increase, which is mind-blowing year over year, where Apple hasn't actually achieved that level of performance in many years, and the A17 Pro only managed a 10% CPU boost compared to 30%. Dang. And we actually have a leaked benchmark from the Xiaomi 14 showing an absolutely insane performance score of 7,494 in the latest Geekbench 6, which blows my mind. Now, the S23 Ultra with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 scored 5,284 in our test, while the 15 Pro Max got 7,272. So it not only made up that big gap, but even exceeded the A17 Pro. Now we have to take this with a grain of salt because we don't know how the ship was cooled and how it would perform in the chassis of the S23 Ultra. If we do the math based off the S23 Ultra, we would get roughly 6,900 or so, which is still a massive jump but we'll have to wait and see how this chip performs in the upcoming S24 Ultra. Now, there's a lot more that is very impressive about this new chip, but first, how did they achieve such a big jump and caught up or maybe even beat Apple's long-standing lead? First off, this is an eight-core CPU compared to Apple's six-core A17 Pro. Now, Apple has always had lower core counts for a very long time, and I remember when the iPhone 6S still came with a dual core, whereas my Samsung had a quad core. And Apple only moved to quad core processors when Androids started using A core. Apple has always focused on large high performance cores, and even the A17 Pro has two main performance cores, and the other four cores are just power efficiency cores for saving battery life. But Qualcomm has done something different with this year's CPU. The HN2 had one high performance core, four mid-tier cores, and three efficiency cores, so performance was kind of spread around. 
the A Gen 3 still has one high performance core running at 3.3 gigahertz, but instead of four mid-range cores at 2.8, they now have five cores, which run at a maximum of 3.15. So that is roughly a 13% speed increase uh, with a 25% boost in core counts. Now, they only have two efficiency cores instead of three, but they run slightly faster at 2.27 instead of two gigahertz. What's going to be very interesting is how will that affect standby time and background tasks since Apple's four efficiency cores are also very good at performance and efficiency and that really helps the battery life and the standby time. With that, one of Apple's biggest improvements is their neural engine that actually had an impressive improvement this year, but the 8 Gen 3's hexagon NPU also got a very impressive 98% performance improvement while being 40% more efficient. Efficient. One thing that I made a big deal of is the new X70 modem paired with the A17 Pro, which made a really big real-world cellular speed improvement while also getting better reception and saving battery life. But the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 gets an even better one since Qualcomm is the one who actually makes these for Apple II, and the new X75 now supports 10 gigabit per second download speeds compared to 7.5, but real-world improvement speeds can be better than that 20 25%. In fact, Qualcomm is making really big claims. It is also 20% more power efficient. And of course, Apple won't get that for another year with the upcoming iPhone 16 series. So they are about a year behind. Now the iPhone 15 finally got Wi-Fi 6E built in just like the latest MacBooks, but the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 has Wi-Fi 7 support, which has numerous improvements even to help out 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz bands, whereas Wi-Fi 6E mainly added the six gigahertz band, and that mainly just gives you better speeds if you're in very close range. The 15 lineup finally got USB Type-C, which Androids have been using forever, and the 15 Pro lineup has a port that is really powerful, beating out most Androids. For example, it could run at 10 gigabit per second instead of five gigabit per second, and it has full display port support, so you could connect it to a high resolution display as well as powerful docks to get a ton of different outputs and inputs. Well, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 now has that as well, matching the 10 gigabit per second transfer speeds and also really good external monitor support, just like the flagship iPhones. It can also support 24 gigabytes of RAM, which is crazy since the iPhone 15 Pros have eight gigabytes, but who knows if any smartphones will actually support that since it is really overkill but the memory speed has a 25% improvement in bandwidth at 64 versus 51.2 gigabits a second. It also supports 4K 120 FPS video, which I suspect that the A17 Pro can also do, but Apple just isn't making use of it, even though they technically could with the processors. And same thing with 8K video, which would be perfect with that 48 megapixel sensor, but they are not enabling it. Now, one way that Qualcomm still falls behind is single core performance. The A17 Pro scores a crazy high 2925, beating out the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2's 2003. The new Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 scores 2,207, so that is only a 10% improvement in single core performance compared to the HN2, but that's all that Apple got with the whole A17 chip performance. Now, Android phones have pretty much always had worse single core performance compared to Apple's chip designs, even though Qualcomm tries to improve this by having a single core that can clock higher compared to the rest. For example, the peak performance core in the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 hits 3.3 gigahertz, but Apple's two performance cores hit a crazy high 3.78 gigahertz. That has a better design. So in single core, the A17 Pro is about 33% more powerful, even though the clock speed is just 14% higher. So that shows that Apple's design is just better. One thing that I've thought about is why doesn't Apple just take the next step and move towards an eight core design? Right now, they're still sticking with the two performance cores, where, where Qualcomm now technically has six that are focused on performance instead of efficiency. When you have more cores, you could run them at slower speeds, which is a lot more efficient than trying to get very high clock speeds, which is why having two performance cores in the A17 Pro actually uses up to 14 watts of power compared to 10 watts in the previous A16 
Bionic, and that chip is not that much slower while using a lot less power. So they technically could run at a little bit lower clock speed, but have four performance cores and get some insane performance like they do with the new M2 and the upcoming M3 chips. It is definitely more worth doing that. So you guys let me know your thoughts down below. Is it exciting to actually have competition now on the Android side in terms of processors? Hopefully that helps Apple to really step it up with their chip design and be able to um, push that further now that the comp competition has caught up or maybe even exceeded them in certain areas. You guys let me know your thoughts. Go ahead and click that circle above to subscribe. Check out one of those videos right over there. This has been Max and I'll see you in the next one.